Okay, let's solve some SAT questions that was generated by AI. So let's look at the first one. The first one tells us solve for x. So we have some quadratic equation. Uh, I'm going to straight, I'm going to jump into the quadratic equation uh, formula, which is negative b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, which is also known as the discriminant over 2a. We can then identify a. a is the first term in front of my x squared. So this would just be degrees, right? So the second degree. So a is therefore equal to 2. Uh, b is equal to negative 5. And then we have c, which is equal to 3. So now we can solve. We can solve for x1 and x2. So negative b means negative 5. So in that case, it's going to be 5, right? Since negative 5 times negative 1 is, is 1. Uh, is 5, positive 5. Then we have negative 5 squared, which is 25. So I'll do it over here. We have the discriminant over here. So 25 minus 4 times 2 is 8. 8 times 3 is 24. So we have minus 24. So we have 1 over 2 times 2, which is 4. I can then simplify this to say, well, um, it's going to be 5 plus minus 1 over 4. Therefore, I get... For the first one will be 4 over 4, so x sub 1 can be 4 over 4, which is 1. So my first x value is equal to 1. My second x value, so x sub 2, will then be equal to 5 plus 1 over 4, which is 6 over 4. Therefore, I get 1.5, or 3 over 2. So that's how I solved the first question, finding using the quadratic formula. Or you can just simply use uh, the normal FOIL method and then use this little box where you have the AC. So you multiply A and C and you have B and then you can solve uh, by using the multiples of 3. So it's going to be 3 and 1, etc, etc. Okay, let's look at the second one. So the linear equation, if Y is equal to, so let's, let's write down what we have. So this was question 1, this was question 2. If y is equal to 3x plus 7 and x is equal to 4, find y. So in these type of situations, all we want to do is simply substitute what we have. We have x is 4 plus 7. Therefore, I get 12 plus 7, which is equal to 19. Okay, let's look at the third one. The third one says the function composition. So given the f of x is equal to 2x plus 1, find and g of x is equal to x squared, find f times g of x. So essentially what this means is you first want to calculate where the g of x uh, is equal to 3, right? So it's going to be 3 squared. After you've solved this, you then want to uh, replace whatever value you calculated in here into your f of x, since it tells us you want the g of x where g is 3, and you want to substitute that into f of x to find for x. <coughs> so they're just giving a statement here to, to tell you what x will be. So let's do it. So let's say g of 3 is equal to 3 squared. Therefore, it's 9. Next, we're going to substitute this g of x, where, g, where x is equal to 3, into the f of x. So the f of 9, then, is going to be uh, 2 times 9 plus 1. Therefore, we get 18 plus 1. So my final answer will be 19. Wow, double 19. Interesting. Okay, let's look at the next one. So that was algebra and functions, some basic, basic questions. I will do this one in white. So this will be the white color. The next one will be red color. So the, the geometry and trigonometry questions will be in red. Okay, so... <coughs> uh, find the radius of a circle if the area is equal to 50 pi units squared. So we have the area, which is equal to 50 pi units squared. We can immediately identify that r squared is equal to 50, right? Since the area of a circle is going to be radius or pi times radius squared. In this case, we can identify that r squared is equal to 50. So to get rid of r squared, I place both in a square root. So r would then be equal to the square root of 50. 
which is either 5 square root 2 or approximately 7.1. Now keep in mind that this value can be, r can be equal to both positive and negative, but since we're working with some type of side length, we will, we will use the negative value, ah, the positive value, okay? Okay, so that was number one. So I'm gonna place number one in this box. Let's look at number two. I'm running out of space here. Okay. Number two says, um, in a right triangle, if one of the angle is 30 degrees and the hypotenuse is 10, find the lengths of the other two. Okay. So what we want to do here is we want to draw a little picture, right? We can make either side 30 since it's not specified. And they tell us the hypotenuse is 10. When we see an angle, we see right angle and we see hypotenuse. So we're given a theta, we're given a side length, and we're given a right triangle. We can then safely know that we're going to use trigonometry to solve this one. So let's assign names, x and y. So to solve x, I'm going to use cosine, right? So cosine of 30 is equal to my adjacent side over my hypotenuse. So in this case, it's going to be 10 cosine 30, which is equal to x. So therefore, x, if I jump over to my calculator, let's see, 10 cosine 30, that gives me 5 square root 3. Okay, so I get 5 square root 3. Now for y, however, we can, we can use two methods here. So that was the first one. That's the first length, so it's going to be 5 square root 3. For the second one, we can either use Pythagoras, Pythagoras' theorem, where we have, uh, in this case, it's going to be x squared plus y squared is equal to 10 squared. We can use that. We can substitute our x with 5 square root 3, obviously squared, plus y squared is equal to 100 squared. You can, I mean, <laughs> ten, 10 squared, sorry, or which is 100. Or we can use a trig ratio again. So in this case, I will use... Um, let me do the full calculation. So it's going to be sine because I have the opposite and the hypotenuse. So it's going to be sine of 30 is equal to y over 10. I'm going to cross multiply. That gives me the same calculation as earlier. It's equal to y. So 10 sine 30 is 5. Okay, so we have 5. Now one way to test this is we can now write our triangle. We have five square root three and we have five if you have time and we can solve. So we can then say, well, five square root three squared plus five squared should be equal to uh, 10 squared since this has to be true if I have some right angle. Pythagoras' theorem tells us that this, the two legs squared should be equal to the hypotenuse squared. If this is not true, we don't have a right triangle. So our, our, our trigonometry fundamentals are wrong, right? Uh, one thing I can say with trigonometry, especially in the SATs, is memorizing the phrase so katoa. You might have come across this phrase, which just means sine is equal to the opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is equal to the adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is equal to the opposite over adjacent. So let me solve this one. So we have um, the square root, so it becomes three. This is how the, the calculation looks. You can think of this canceling out this. Why is that? Since I can rewrite this as three raised to the one half or inside the parentheses, excuse me, raised to the one half times two, this two multiplies in, it becomes three, two over two, that becomes three. Since two over two is one, I have three raised to the one, which is then simply three, okay? So it's going to be then 25, since I have to multiply the two with the square root three and the five, so that becomes 25 times three plus 25. That gives me 75 plus 25, which is equal to 100. 
Therefore, we do have 100 is equal to 100. So we can confidently know that our answer will be correct. Now, obviously, you can skip all of these. I just wanted to make it um, clear for the, for the video. Anyway. Uh, find sine 45 using trig ratios. Okay, find sine 45 using trig ratios. So how does that look? Well, you have this special triangle, which is 45, 45, 90. This is known as the 45, 45, 90 triangle. And for this triangle, you have 1, 1, square root 2. Okay. So now, the sine of 45 is going to be equal to my opposite. Now, it doesn't really matter since these two angles are identical. Okay, so I'm going to take my opposite, which becomes 1 over square root 2. So I cannot leave sine 45 as 1 over square root 2 because this is in a radical form. I, I want it in a, in, a, in a rational form. Okay, so one way I can do this is I can multiply both top and bottom with the square root of 2. To, to eliminate the square roots. This then becomes square root 2 over the square root of 4, since we're going to multiply the values, the root values, with each other. Okay. <coughs> now I know the square root of 4 is equal to 2, so my final answer will then be uh, the square root of 2 over 2. Okay. Uh, I'm going to quickly erase just the side of the board since I, I, I ran oh, I ran out of space okay hmm? so get the next ones so that was uh, geometry and trigonometry so let's look at probability and statistics well, what is the probability of rolling a sum of eight on two dice? Okay. So you need to have some conceptual understanding of what's being asked here. What's being asked is, if I throw this dice, or these two dice, or die as they refer to it, the die, oh, I don't like that word. This means that if I thro throw both of them collectively at the same time, what is the probability? So what's the probability of my throw being greater or the sum of so it's equal to eight so you can map this out really we can map this so we can say well four and four gives me eight we can say six and two gives me eight so i'm going to add um it just do it like this because i am messed up so it's going to be six and two and two and six right so we can say, well, 4 and 4, that gives me 6. 6 and 2 gives me 6. Uh, 2 and 6 gives me 8. Excuse me, it's 8. Because the sum needs to be 8. So 8, 8, 8. Then, hmm, what else do we have? Well, we have 5 and 3. And then 3 and 5. Okay, gives me 8, 8. And that's it. That's the only possibilities I can have. Now... If I throw two, two dice at the same time, right? So two die, if I throw it at the same time, let's think about this. I have a one out of six chance of throwing a value, right? Now, considering I'm throwing both at the same time, I need to multiply one over six with one over six, which gives me one out of 36 possibilities. So these would be the possibilities, right? The total possibilities or total combinations that, that I have to, to throw these values. So I considering I have how many? I have five over here, right? So I have five chances or five possibilities that I can throw it. So if I have five possibilities and there's a total of 36 chance, I can then say, well, my fi final answer will be five out of 36. Now, one thing they could ask you is, well, what's the percentage of this happening? So then you can just multiply this with 100 over one we get 5 over 36 times 100. This gives me approximately, so approximately 13.9% or approximately 
If it's round to the nearest percent, you'll do this. If it's round to the nearest tenth, you'll do this. If it's round to the nearest one hundredth, you'll do this, etc., etc. Okay, cool. Let's look at the next one. We have uh, find the mean, medium of the set. Okay, you need to be familiar with the conceptual understanding. Mean means average. So you take the sum of all these numbers and divide it by the total amount of numbers. So it becomes very straightforward. So you have 4 plus 8 plus 3 plus 7 plus 9. And you want to divide this by how many values there are in the set. Okay, there's five values in the set. So I'm going to get the calculator. So we have 5, 4, excuse me, 4 plus 8 plus 3 plus 7 plus 9. That gives me 31. 31 divided by 5, that gives me 6.2. So the average of this data set is 6.2. What about the median? Well, the median is just some, some middle, middle value. But now be aware that you have to arrange your, your data set in an order that is ascending. Okay? Ascending order. So let's do that. I have 3, then 4 then seven, then eight, then nine. So the median is just pretty much the middle value. Okay, the middle value. So I can cancel out the two outer ones then the two semi-inner ones. So the median is therefore seven. Okay, very nice. I'm gonna grab my eraser quick. Greatest apologies. Now we get to a little bit of a tricky question. I mean, I wouldn't really call it tricky, but for standard deviation, there's some, some things you need to know. So standard deviation would just be, again, how we spread out the data, right? So a very reliable way of spreading out data. Oh, sorry, my Zoom just opened. So how do we calculate the standard deviation? Well, the standard deviation has this formula. We have sigma squared is equal to the sum... <coughs> where you have x sub i, x sub i is just the value in the term, minus mu, which is the average, and you're going to divide this by n, which is the total amount of terms. So if I had to rewrite this, I'll show you what I mean. What is this x sub i? Well, the x sub i is just your first term, second term, third term, fourth term, fifth term, and you're going to subtract it from the average. And then finally, you want to place all of it in a square root. Okay, so let's say 5. Firstly, we have to calculate mu. Mu is just the mean, or it's the mean and the average. All of them mean the same thing. So I can say 5 plus 7 plus 8 plus 10 plus 12. We're going to divide this by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's go calculate mu. It's a Greek symbol. Okay, very important, little mu. Um, okay, that gives me an average of 8.4. We have an 8.4 average. Now I need to clear this because my calculation is going to be a little bit long. Okay. So it's going to be 8.5 minus 8.4. Excuse me, you want to square this too. Squared plus. Next one. 8.4 squared plus. 8 minus 8.4 squared plus. 10 minus 8.4 plus 12 minus 8.4 squared. And we want to place this over. Uh, we said there's 5. This gives me what? Hmm. Oh, it's going to be a long calculation. So I'm going to... I'm going to grab an Excel sheet. Okay. And the reason I use an Excel sheet is... Just to quickly speed up the process for myself, so I can finish this video. Uh, one data set is missing. Oh, it's five. Okay, so I missed five. So on my Excel sheet, I'm going to type equal st population with a p. Okay, I'm going to select my data set, and I get my standard deviation of 2.4. So my standard deviation is 2.41, or approximately. 
Now uh, you can calculate this on a calculator by then placing this value you get over here inside of a square root and you should find exactly 2.41. But XR is a quick and easy way to, to, to validate your answers. Uh, you, can, you can obviously do it with um, where you have average. So you have average and then you can practice. Uh, and then let's say you want to say to A7 and you can see your, your average range or to find your average. Okay, well that is probability and statistics. Let's go over to the next one. I have to constantly erase because... Uh okay, let's do data analysis and problem solving. So I will use purple for this one. This one's purple. If a line shows a steady decrease in the temperature over a week, what was the average rate of change per day? Well, to answer this question, you obviously need some type of graph, right? So the graph was not provided. So let's say we have some function. We have a steady rate of change. It would look like this. Now for this, we can just measure the change in X over the change in Y. Okay, we can measure the change in X over the change in y, which is also known as the slope of the function. So you get the change in x, change in y over the change in x, and this gives me y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which is therefore m, which is also equal to the slope. So this one from this point to this point would be the change in x, and from this point to that point would be the change in y. So let's say we have a change in 1 and we have a change in 3. That means we had a 3 over 1, which is a constant change of 3. Now let's say the temperature is going down, as it is in this case. We have a negative 3 degrees Celsius. Let's say degrees Celsius slope, meaning every day my temperature goes down by 3 degrees constantly. So we can make predictions what will happen. Okay, we'll make predictions what can happen. <coughs> So this is how you would answer these type of questions. Uh, clearly, there's no function given here, but in this case, we can just say, well, the temperature is constant. It's a constant slope. Constant slope. Uh, anyway. Uh, if a shirt costing $40 is marked down to by 25%, what is the sale price? Well, for this, we can use percentage minus the rate. And we can multiply this with the original price. What this means is currently my product is at 100%. So I'm going to simply use one. I'm going to subtract my discount since it's marked down by 25%, which means I will sell my shirt for 0.75, also 75% of my original price. I can then multiply this by 40 since this is given to us as uh, a shirt costing $40 is marked down by 25%. What is the sale price? It means what is the consumer buying? Well, in this case, the consumer is paying $32 uh, for a shirt that was originally $40, and we have some sort of discount. Okay. <coughs> if the ratio of boys to girls in a class is 3.3 uh, 3 in ratio to 2, uh, and there are 30 students in the total. How many boys are there? Okay. So in this case, we can see a ratio. So let's put number three over here. We can see a ratio three to two. If this is a ratio, there's a total of five. Meaning, we see boys. The, the first thing would always represent what is mentioned first in your sentence. Okay. The two represents girls. Very important, you need to look at the wording. So boys, two girls, meaning three boys, two, two girls. So we have a three out of five boys, and we have a two out of three girls. If I add those fractions together, I get a total population of five out of five. So you have to add these two values together and then place it over the total. Okay, very important. Ratios, very important. So how many boys are there? So for boys, what we can do is we can then say, well, since there's three out of five boys, 
we can multiply this with 30 over 1 to find the amount of boys. I can simplify by saying 5 goes into 30 6 times and when I'm left with 1 that gives me this 18 boys in total. And then if we wanted to find the girls, we can simply say the total amount of students minus the boys is obviously equal to the girls. Okay. Okay. Let's get the final questions. The final questions uh, is a little bit of an advanced topics according to ChatGPT4. <laughs> okay, so we have an exponential function. Exponential function is just something that looks like this. Okay. Um, so they say find the value of y. So 2y is equal to 32, number one. Okay, so for these type of questions, you need to be familiar with, either you can be familiar with logarithms or exponents. To solve these type of equations, we can set, set the same basis set the same base what this means is if i have three raised to the second power this little thing over here is also known as my exponent okay and this one will be known as my base so my, i have my base and i have my exponent so setting the same base, now we need to think, can anything, r uh, since I have y raised to the second, or, or, or 2 raised to the y, is there anything that could be raised, 2 raised to something gives me 32, is that possible? It becomes tricky if this, if this answer is 31, then all of a sudden it becomes a little bit more of a complicated equation. But is there something, oh by the way for, for that one if it's 31 you can just use logarithms where you have your base answer exponent, okay? So, well, well, what about 2 raised to the 5? What is 2 raised to the 5? Well, look at that. It's 32. So, if I can find the same basis, I can then set my exponents equal to one another. If I can find, I'll repeat that, if I can find the same basis, I can set my exponents equal to one another. Okay, how we can solve this using logarithms is I have a base. So you have log, the base value, which is 2. Then you place your answer over here and you can say it's y. So if you head over to your calculator, you type log base 2, 32, it gives you 5. So there's two ways we can solve this question. Number one. Okay, let's look at number two. Number two, find the roots. Finding the roots means this. If you have some parabola, you have negative five over here. So you have some parabola. These, this is my y-intercept, which you can find this value. These are my x roots, okay? My x roots. So I have one x root and I have another root. They're also known as the x intercepts, right? So w we are supposed to, they ask us to find this, these roots. Uh, so let's do that. We have x squared minus 4x minus 5. Is there any way I can solve? Wait, they say quadratic equation, find the roots using the quadratic formula. Well, I don't really need to use it since I can simply say, well, x minus 5 and x plus 1, that gives me x is equal to negative 1 and x is equal to negative 5. So you can, s uh, positive 5, excuse me, since you set this equal to 0, we can then just solve, solve for the roots. But since we asked to use the quadratic equation, uh, I mean, you can just... Uh, click these answers and they should work. But let's see, maybe I made a mistake. So let's use the quadratic equation since this is what they want. We have negative negative 4 plus minus the square root of 16 minus 4 
times one times negative five that gives me plus 20 okay plus 20 why is that because negative 4 times 1 times negative 5 is negative 4 times negative 5 is 20 and we're going to place this over 2 uh, I did the quadratic equation a bit earlier so we have 4 plus minus uh, the square root of 36 which is 6 over 2 so I can then say well 4 minus 6 over 2 that gives me negative 2 over 2 which is negative 1 negative 1 is over there and then for the second one so this would be x sub 1 it make this x sub 1 x sub 2 for the second one we have x sub 2 which is going to be 4 plus 6 over 2 which is 10 over 2 which is 5 so this one would be 5 okay so our answers are correct for the next one some complex numbers we have how much space do I have? Oh, I still have a lot. Okay, say three plus two i plus mm, four minus three i. Okay, this one's very easy actually. You can just rewrite this plus two i plus four minus three i. Why is that? Because he is currently an invisible plus one, so you just multiply it in. And plus multiply anything just becomes whatever it is, right? So if it's a negative symbol, if you multiply plus with negative, it just becomes uh, plus anyway. Uh, negative, sorry. So now we can add the like terms. So that gives me 7 plus. Um, so that's going to be minus i. But let's, let's do it a little bit more difficult. What if they ask us to multiply these two values? So here we're going to use the FOIL method. So the FOIL method tells us that first out is in is last. You want to multiply every single every single value in this one with every single value in the opposite um, parentheses, okay? Vice versa. And the co complex rule that you need to know in this situation is that i squared is equal to negative one. Okay, so let's use the FOIL method. So I have 3 times uh, uh, 4 is 12. 3 times uh, n negative 3i becomes negative 9i. Since you're going to multiply the real number with the real number, and the i's, the imaginary numbers, just multiply with the imaginary numbers. We have 2i times 4 again, the real numbers. So it becomes 8 times i, so 8i. And then we have negative 6i squared. So look at this. Over here I have i squared. So I can then say, well, it's going to be 2 minus i, since 9, negative 9 plus 8 is negative 1. So I am left with a negative i. And here I'm going to say plus 6. So I get 18 minus i. And why do I say plus 6 over here? Since if we follow our complex rules, we're going to substitute i squared with negative 1. So we have negative 6 times negative 1, which is positive 6. So then it becomes plus 6. So then we have 12 plus 6, which is equal to 18. Okay, so this was a quick little uh, logical, um, or maybe some basic basic mathematics that, that could potentially be... Uh, SAT-related SAT questions according to artificial intelligence. Okay.